All right, so here we go. We're going to enter into a, uh, a series of series on the book of Romans, and uh, it, it, this is a big undertaking for me. Uh, I've taught through the book of Romans many times. I don't know that I've ever actually preached through Romans, but, uh, and, and, and that can be a hard thing because when I think about the book of Romans, it, it very much becomes a theological academic kind of thing to me because I, when I teach Romans, it's usually in a, in a, a college or university setting. It's, it's more academic uh, in nature. And so I, I'm, you're going to get a little bit of both because it's just there in me and it's a part of it. But it, what I really believe is that, is that if we take the time to actually understand, understand what is going on in the context that it happened originally, we will be able to better understand how we can now apply it to our lives and how we can better uh, uh, get an application from it. Um, and so I'm, I'm really going to work hard at balancing that out. And, and you know, uh, some of you are more on that side. You love that academic stuff and the facts and the figures and the dates and the times and all that, all that stuff. I'm with you. I love them too. Uh, on the other hand, there are those that just want the application and just want, what can I do with that today? And, and I'm with you. I, I love that too. So we're going to try to smash it together and, and and, and get plenty of both out of it uh, because there is a lot there in 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 the book of Romans. But I want to I want to just come at it um, hopefully maybe in a way that you've never thought of uh, or, or a way that that maybe you haven't taken the time to uh, to go through. And so just uh, I hope you'll get excited about it as I do. The, the book of Romans, what I believe about the book of Romans is it's a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul, and it was written uh, in, a, in a way that encapsulates the theology of the Christian faith. Uh, it, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are a, a historical narrative that captures the life of Jesus, the life and teaching of Jesus, at least parts of it, not all of it, but parts of it, and, and, and helps us to see Jesus as a human being on the planet, living and teaching and, and becoming or being an example for us of how to live the normal Christian life. And we've talked a lot about that uh, throughout the years. The book of Romans, I believe, is the Holy Spirit inspiring the Apostle Paul to write a theological treatise of what that means to us now and, and how we are to take what Jesus taught and what Jesus did and, con- and, and maybe translate it into something that we can now live out in our lives. And so that, that's really what I, what I see when I see the book of Romans. I, I think the book of Romans is probably uh, the, most theolo- the, the most important theological document that we have uh, in, in, the, in the New Testament um, outside of the Gospels where we, where we literally see what Jesus did and said. Um, because everything else pretty much in the New Testament that we find that is theologically doctrinal, meaning it, it, it's essential for us to know to live the Christian life, is, is pretty much found in this letter called the Romans. Called, uh, called Romans, I'm sorry. It, it's a letter to the Romans, to the Roman church. And so I, I just want to start out with the first, uh, the first seven uh, verses. The, the sermon today is called, Tell Me How You Really Feel. Because this is what I really think that God is saying to us. He's saying in the book of Romans to us, this is how I really feel. This is what I really want you to know. This is how I really want you to apply what I have done and, and the magnitude of my love and grace for you and, and the call to uh, holiness. I want you to, uh, this is how I really feel about it. And so we're just going to kind of start out from that from that perspective in Romans chapter 1 verse 1 it says this Paul a servant of Christ Jesus called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophet in the holy scriptures regarding his son who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power 
by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, we received grace and apostleship to call all Gentiles to the obedience uh, that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, I, I'm going to go back and we're going to unpack those seven verses because I, I think they, are, they hold within them um, incredible chunks of truth that, that we have to get a hold of if we're really going really to experience the Christian life that God has called us to. So, n- number one. And this is where some of the academia comes out. So just bear with me. Um, the Apostle Paul, it's written, this letter is written by the Apostle Paul in a, around AD 57, 20 some years after uh, the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Christ. Uh, the Apostle Paul is writing probably from Corinth. He's probably in the city of Corinth on his third missionary journey. He did uh, at least three, possibly four, uh, but in the book of Acts it's recorded three, three missionary journeys that he did. And this was his final one. This was the last one toward the end of his ministry. And, and he's writing this down. He's capturing the, the theological treatise of what it means to be a Christian. And, and, and he's being inspired by the the Holy Spirit to capture this so that we will be able to pass this on from generation to generation through the Holy Scripture so that we will know and understand how God really feels and how, how he really thinks about this and what this has called us to. So I, I, I'm going to try to break that down for you today. This is going to be a very fast-flying, 30,000-foot flyover introduction of the book of Romans, and we will spend the next, I don't know, seven years unpacking the rest of the, the letter. No, it won't be that long, but, but uh, we're, we're just going to do what God calls us to do as we go along here. But, uh, the, the, so the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Rome. Now, I don't know what picture pops into your mind when you think about the church at Rome in this time, in the first century, you know, uh, when this is happening, but it wasn't the Vatican. Let me just put it to you that way. Uh, th- this wasn't uh, some big, huge cathedrals and big buildings and, and, and masses of people. This was probably, uh, based on the end of the book and who he actually addresses the letter to, it was probably written to about five different house churches, uh, groups of people that met in homes uh, in, around the city of Rome and, and so, you know, they, they met possibly uh, secretly in, in hiding because they could have probably been persecuted. There was a great persecution going on around this time and after this time. Uh, so it was dangerous to be in this new sect of of religion called Christianity or the way. Um, and so as they, as they live this out, the Apostle Paul's writing this letter and it's to be delivered and then passed around between these home churches. And I, I want you to hear that. I want you to know that because I want, to, I want you to feel how gritty this is. Right? Sometimes when we think about the Bible, we think about the book of Romans and we think about the church at Rome and all that thing. We, we start to think, you know, everything is prim and proper and polished and stained glass and painted ceilings and all this kind of stuff. And I'm telling you right now, this was down and dirty. Like these were people that were hiding in the trenches, that, that were living out this new calling in their life. And, and, the, and the Holy Spirit was, was r- opening up something in them that they didn't fully understand, they didn't fully grasp. On the, in this end of it, we have the, the, the great advantage of already having the book of Romans and having it been studied and taught and preached for thousands of years now. But they, this was brand new to them. This was all new and God was beginning to open their eyes and to help them to see and, 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 and calling them to follow him. And, and it was all like, I don't know what to do. We've never seen this done before. We don't know the language. We don't know how to step into this. But, and, and so Paul is writing this letter into that culture so that they could, so that they could begin this life, this way of life that is, 
that, that's brand new and, and, and dangerous and I would imagine exciting at the same time. Many of these people in Rome, they, they, it was made up of both Jews and Gentiles that were gathering, that were worshiping together, uh, R- Roman Gentiles uh, that were there, and then Jews that were also there, we find out later throughout the book, uh, that there were Jewish believers there as well, and, and those Jews could have possibly been uh, there because they were exiled from Rome, they were, I mean from Jerusalem, from Israel, they were, you know, there was a great persecution beginning to boil up there, and and, and they were being pushed out, and, and they were going from, you know, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the, of the earth. And at that point, Rome was pretty close to the ends of the earth uh, for most of them, and, and so they were living there. It's also possible, though, uh, that some of these Jewish believers were... Uh, became believers at the day of Pentecost. Many years earlier, when uh, in Acts chapter 2, when Pentecost happened, when the Holy Spirit came after Jesus' ascension, He told them, wait here in Jerusalem when I will send the Helper. I will send the Holy Spirit to, to give you power, to empower you to do what you're going to do. Uh, and, and so these, these believers, these Jewish uh, people are... At, in Jerusalem to celebrate this Jewish holiday, and it's during that Jewish holiday of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit comes, and the apostles begin to preach, and they see all this magnificent stuff happening, and it says in the book, in, in Acts chapter 2, that over, that over 3,000 people believed that day and were baptized and became believers. In Acts chapter 2, verse 10, it says, and there were many visitors there from Rome. So it's very possible that some of these Jewish believers were there on that day of Pentecost and then had gone back to their homes and began uh, to live out what they, had, what they had gotten there in Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost. Um, it, it, so, so this is all brand new. It's all grassroots kind of stuff that's happening and they're figuring it out. And so r- the Apostle Paul is writing this letter into that culture and into that framework. So uh, here's, here's my goal, uh, why I tell you all of that, because I'm really trying to rub off some of the polish. I, I'm, re- I'm, really trying to, I'm really trying to scratch it up a little bit and, and, and mess it up a little bit so that you can understand that from, from the, ve- the very beginning, Christianity has been a, has, has, uh, Christianity is, is a way of life that is not some pietistical, ritualistic, um, you know, polished up thing, face that we put on. It's a call. It's a calling. It's a calling into a life to believe and, and, and to believe in such a way that it changes the way we live. It changes the decisions we make. It changes the standards that we set for ourselves. It changes the way that we do everything that we do because our Lord has saved us. So I, I, I want to I want to talk to you about that. It's the, the Apostle Paul declares that he is an apostle. In verse one, he says it this way: uh, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. And set apart for the gospel of God. That word gospel means good news. That it is good news that he has been sent with. This apostle, Paul, he started out as a Pharisee, a Jewish Pharisee who was a a keeper of the law. A keeper of the Old Testament covenant. The Old Testament law written by Moses. And his job was was, was to basically enforce that law among the Jewish people to keep them together. It was a very legalistic, it was a very pietistic way of life, that that he stayed separate from humanity, but this was a very passionate man, and he was a very zealous man, and because he believed that's what God had called him to do, when this thing like 
called Christianity began to crop up, when these people began to, to, to follow this man named Jesus, uh, the Apostle Paul, it, being the Jewish Pharisee that he was, he began to try to stamp it out. He began to try to put out that fire and to get rid of that. And he literally had uh, authority given to him from the, from the authorities that, to, to be able to go and persecute and imprison and even kill believers of this new way of life. And it was on his road to Damascus that he had an encounter that changed everything. Jesus confronts him on the road to Damascus three different times in the book of Acts. He he recounts this moment that Jesus comes and speaks to him and says, Paul, at that point he's called Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? And Jesus reveals himself to him And he calls him to go on into Damascus and and to meet with one of his believers there named Ananias. And and Ananias would preach, would would share the good news, the gospel with him. And he would believe and be baptized. And and then he would get up and begin a ministry that would change the world. But understand that this man, the Apostle Paul, who's writing this letter, is a passionate man is a passionate person who has given his life over completely to the pursuit of spreading this gospel, to being an apostle. This word apostle is, a, is an interesting word. There are, Christian, there are Christian definitions of the word apostle, meaning that to be an actual apostle, to hold the office of apostle, you had to have actually seen Jesus with your own eyes. You you had to have encounter with him. You had to be called by him and empowered by him to be a carrier of his message. And that was to be one of the apostles, capital A. But the truth is there is a thing called an apostolic calling or an apostolic mandate that we as the church have inherited that we've been have passed down down to us when Jesus says go into all the world and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them everything that I've commanded you and lo I will be with you always to the end. we recognize that as the great commission well that commission sends us out on an apostolic calling to, to the, the word uh, the, 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 ap, the apostle the word apostle didn't originate with the church it originated in Greek when when um, Alexander the Great would was taking over the world he, he, w- he would go through a city and, and he would conquer a city and then he would move on and that city would just go right back to the same old culture that it was after they kind of rebounded and recouped. Uh, and, and he realized this is not working. So he started to have this other army that would follow through behind him and, and they were called apostles. They were on an apostolic mission. So what they would do is when Alexander the Great would conquer a town he would send apostles in and they would change the culture of that town into the Greek culture from which they came now this idea was passed on to the church in the apostles that when we go into the world we go into the world from the kingdom of God and we take the culture of the kingdom of God into the culture of the world and change the culture of the world into the kingdom of God culture does that make sense When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, pray this, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Understand, that is an apostolic prayer. Your will in heaven be done on earth. Change the culture of of earth to the culture of heaven. A a very simple example of that is when, when we, if you want more stuff, right? If you want if you want more, how, what do you do in the world? Well, you get all you can, you can all you get, and you sit on your can. So nobody messes with your stuff, right? And that's how you do it in the world. But how do we do it in the kingdom? In the culture of the kingdom, if you want more, what do you do? You give more. You give more. It's, it's opposite to the kingdom, to the, to the culture of the world. But let me just tell you, it works. It just works. I don't know how it works. God makes it work. It just works. 
You know, I don't know, I, I don't care how the sun comes up in the morning. I just know God makes it come up and it just works. And I don't have to know how. I just need, I just live in the law of it. I just live in the operation of it. And so that's one way that we are changing the culture of the world to the culture of the kingdom because we are on an apostolic mandate, okay? Now, before your eyes glaze over, we're going to get to some application. So just hold on. Stay with me. One second. Romans chapter 2, or Romans, Romans 1 verse 2 says this, the gospel promised before, beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures regarding his son who as, to, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed, to, was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord. According to Paul here, Jesus is the center of the gospel message, plain and simple. Jesus is the good news. Jesus is at the center of the, of the gospel message. It, it, when we talk about good news or gospel in the, in, uh, from the Bible, if we leave Jesus out, you are not talking about the gospel. When we talk about, oh, we can just be, uh, you know, we can just be happy people. We can just have better attitudes and we can just be good people. And we can talk about how to give good marriages and good uh, families and good parenting and all that good stuff. Well, that's all good unless you leave Jesus out of the equation. Because when you leave Jesus out of the equation, that news is no longer good. You are still stuck in your sin. You are still trapped in your prison of your own making called sin. And so when Je- but, but when Jesus is entered into the equation, then the gospel comes in. Then there is good news and he is the center of that. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as the Son of God is the hope of the world. Without it, we are trapped in our sin. Without Jesus, we are, there is no hope. Period, the end. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. You might say, well, that sounds very exclusive and exclusionary. and, and all. No, it's not. Because Jesus came and gave Himself to all. He didn't exclude anyone. He gave Himself to all. So, all who will come and call upon his name, we'll get to that, can be saved. He goes on to say in verse 5, through him, through him, we received grace and apostleship to call all Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith and his name, for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. It says that we, that we received grace, which is the empowerment over sin and the favor of God in our lives to live above and beyond our limitations. Let me, let me just break that down for you because if there's one word that encapsulates what is the book or the letter of Romans about, it is grace. It is the grace of God. And I want you to understand this. The grace of God is not just simply God uh, overlooking our sin. Or, or, or God just, just saying, oh, well, that patting us on the hell, that's okay. It's okay. No, it wasn't okay. He had to pay with his very life uh, and, and, pu- and be punished brutally uh, for this sin so that we could be forgiven. But he did that in grace. He did that by grace. That action, that grace that he, that he lived out, he now gives to us. And, and that grace, that act that he did, that gracious act that he did, it, it now empowers us to be able to live above the sin and the death that we rightfully deserve, to live the life that we are called to live in the Spirit, empowered by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to conquer over all that He has sent us out to conquer. We are now more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, right? We no longer are victims. We now step into our power. What is our power? Our power is the grace of God. That's are you with me? Okay. Don't worry, we'll spend the next months <laughs> unpacking this. It'll come. You'll get it. Verse 
verse 7. In verse 7, he says these words. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. These last two verses, I want you to understand something. These last two verses, I I believe, are, are what hold the key to the message of the letter to the Romans. And, and, and we, could, we could easily look at it as, as just being sort of a, 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 a throwaway greeting. It is not. So I, let, let's just, I want to unpack it a little bit. Number one, our identity is found in the fact that we are loved by God. When we understand that my identity is found in the fact that I am loved by God, that trumps everything else. There's no other power in the universe that can come against me because I am loved by God. We need to get a hold of that. Secondly, our purpose is found in the fact that we are called and empowered by God's grace to be His holy people. Now, let me back up once more. First of all, we are loved by God. That fact is simply the greatest piece of information that any human being could ever receive and, and listen, it's so common that, that if we're not careful, it can lose its impact. Do not hear my voice. Listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth. Do not take for granted that you are loved by God. We will get to it later, but, there, but the book of Romans takes a long, the apostle Paul in Romans takes a lot of time and effort to unpack our true standing with God. And, and, the, and the truth is, according to this, this, this theological treatise, we are born into a, a, a situation where there is no hope. We are born as an object of God's wrath. That, that means that Everything that God is against, that God is angry about, that God uh, should be uh, absolutely de- devastatingly going after, is us. We are the object of His wrath because of our sin and our rejection of Him. But it is because of His love that He gives us grace. When you come to terms with that in, 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 a, in an absolute, I mean, like scratch off all the veneer and all the shiny out, you know, exterior of it and just look at the, at, at the bare grit of what that means, that God has wiped away by His grace all of the sin that would cause Him, that would cause us to be the object of His wrath, and instead He chose to love us and to give us grace undeserving grace by definition cannot be deserved it cannot be earned it must be given as a gift when paul says in the second part of verse 7 grace and peace to you from god that's not just a throwaway greeting he says this thing called grace this thing called peace has been given to you as a gift from God, a Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 says this, that, that we are saved by grace through faith. It, grace is literally the agent that saves us. Grace is what we are saved by. God's grace poured out on us. His decision to not hold us uh, to the punishment, but rather to come and be punished for us on our behalf. He sets us free by His grace. This grace is the power of God in our lives, destroying the sin in our lives and setting us free from the penalty that is rightfully ours. When we sin one time, when we break God's law one time, break God's command one time, we are done forever apart from grace. Grace is the empowerment that restores the relationship, but it doesn't just forgive us of our sin. 
It restores a relationship. It restores a connection with the power of God in us so that when we walk into the world, having been restored through a relationship with God, we walk into the world in the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. We walk in the wisdom and the knowledge and the righteousness of Almighty God. Not because we are good or because we've earned it or deserved it or figured it out. It's because He gave it to us. It is by grace that you are saved by faith. Understand, that, why, why do I beat that? Because, Lord have mercy, that's what I live on. <laughs> I live on grace. Like, if it weren't for grace, what would I be? But for the grace of God, where would I be? Where would you be? Done. Without hope. Without anything. So grace is the embodiment of God's love that God loves you because God loves because of God's love for us we receive grace instead of judgment and wrath and punishment. I want to ask the there's servers that have buckets full of hearts right now. And we're going to ask them to go ahead and give those out. I'm going to keep going as they give them to you and I'll explain what what they're for. But as they come, I just want you to take two. Two hearts. Every every person, take two hearts. Okay? Doesn't matter which color you take either because there are two different colors, so don't get all been out of shape about that. But because of grace, you have peace with God. Paul says grace and peace. Because of God's grace, because of God's love, we have grace that He poured out on us. Because of that grace, we have peace with God who literally we deserve to be squashed by. And instead, He chooses to set us free and to love us and to empower us and to give us a mission and a hope. We have peace in our hearts. We have peace in our heads. All because of God's love for you. Secondly, our purpose is found in the fact that we are called and empowered by His grace to be God's holy people. Now, I don't know what what comes to your mind, what image pops into your head when you think of the word holy. But the word holy literally just simply means to be set apart for a purpose. Right? So if, if, you, if you were, you know, if we had a, a bunch of sheep out on the hillside, you know, back in the old days when they were doing animal sacrifice, a bunch of sheep out on the hillside, and they went out and got one of those sheep out there on the hillside amongst all the rest, they, it's just a sheep, right? Nothing, spe- it's just a sheep. But when they go into those sheep and they pick one out and they bring it out and they set it apart, And they bring it to an altar and they slaughter it on an altar and lay it on the altar before God. It becomes a holy sacrifice. Romans 12 will tell us that if we want to be holy, here's how we do it. Become a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing before God. Lay yourself down before Him and you will become holy. But we become holy when He calls us out. When He calls us by His love. When He calls us by His grace. When He calls us to be holy and to be His holy people. And He gives us a mission and He gives us a message. And that message is simple, but it's the greatest message of all the earth. God loves you. Now, Suzanne's been working about three weeks now on all these hearts that you're holding in your hand. She made about 500 of them. And the reason you have two is because one of them is for you, just to remind you that God loves you. To, to don't take that for granted. The other one is for your mission, because you've been called to be God's holy people. Holy and set apart for a purpose, for a mission, with a message. And I want you to pray. I want you to ask God, who do you want me to go to and, to, and send this and deliver this message to that God loves them? Where do you want me to go? Who do you? Now, and, and listen to me. Please hear what I'm saying. 
Don't just go to low-hanging fruit, okay? Don't just go home and give it to your husband or your wife or, you know, the, 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 that kid that didn't want to come to church this morning, whatever. You know. No, no, no. I'm saying pray about this. Ask God, literally say, God, you have called me. You have given me grace. You have called me to be holy, to be set apart for a mission with a message. This is my message. Who are you sending me to? And I want to encourage you to boldly go to that person and tell them, hey, God sent me with a message to you. He wants you to know he loves you and give him your heart. That's the mission that we're on. As you, this is the mission that God's called us for and set us apart for. I know it might sound simple. The truth is, it's the most profound thing that you ever do. So, so, why do I say that the fact that we are loved by God and called to be His holy people is the key to the message of Romans? Well, it, it, here's why, and I, I, honestly, I'm taking too long in the first part to, I'm going to blast through this, but we will come back to it over and over again. But here's what I want you to see, just a fast flyover of what it looks like when we look at the book of Romans in a, in a larger context. When we understand that we are saved by grace, it changes everything from have to to get to. What do I need to do to be saved? No, it's the wrong question. It's why has God saved me and 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 how can he possibly do this? It, it's, it changes from What do I have to do to be saved? To what do I get to do because God saved me? You follow me? Stay with me here. It it changes from have to to get to because God's love and grace is poured out on you. You would not be here hearing this message, hearing that God loves you if God had not chosen to give you this message to tell you this about himself because when we come into a relationship with God it's not because we decided to be saved it's because God decided to save us Jesus said no one can come to me unless they're called no one can come to the father unless they're called it's the calling of grace It's the gift that God offers that causes it to be a get-to rather than a have-to. What do I have to do to be saved? You can't do anything to be saved. Why not? Because you're saved by grace. And by definition, you can't do anything to earn grace. Right? You get to be saved. Because of God's grace, number one, We get to believe that God exists and that he is in control of all things. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. And listen, we have no excuse, but the problem is if we're still blind, if God has not opened our eyes, if we cannot see it, we will miss it. But when God opens, opens by his grace our eyes and we see we will begin to see God everywhere it's a gift it's a gift the fact that you even question if there's a God if if you think well I wonder you know if God is doing that if you even say the phrase when something bad happens oh my God well why did you say that you have a God yeah you do because he's left you with no excuse look around really (laughs) Can we look around at creation and say there is no God that created all of this, that put all this together? This is just some kind of cosmic accident that happened? That takes a lot more faith. Number two, we get to acknowledge that we are indeed, that we are in need, indeed in need of a Savior. Because we have broken God's law and are in need of forgiveness. When we broke one law, we were done. We needed forgiveness. But Romans 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
We've all sinned. We've all broken it. We are all objects of his wrath, but his grace is freely given through Christ. Number three, we get to. Everybody say get to. Get to. Get to. That's very important, right? Because we say stuff like, what do I have to do to get saved? No, no, no. What do I get to do because God wants to save me is the right question. We get to see the love of God demonstrated for us in the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price for the sin we have committed and offers us eternal life. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. He died for you and me before we could ever do anything to earn it or deserve it. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. A wage is something that you have earned and something that you deserve, right? When you go to work and you work your eight hours, you get paid for your eight hours, you earned it, you deserve it, right? Right? What you have earned and deserved from God, truly, because of sin, is death. But the grace of God, it is by the grace of God that we have been given the gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Number four, we get to proclaim our faith in Christ and his power in our lives. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for it is with your heart that you, are, that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess faith and are saved. And listen, that word heart there, that's not just this thump, 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 beating thing in your chest. That's not just some, you know, cute valentine looking thing. This is the central part of you where you can't lie to you, where you know that you know that that's what you believe. I, I spent many years of my life trying to ignore what I knew in my heart what I believed in my heart. I spent many years trying to run from God and trying to hide from God and, and, and just ignore him. But in my heart, I believed. And who gave me that belief? Who gave me that faith? Who opened my eyes in my heart? God did by his grace. By his grace, he, I once was blind, but now I see. And once God opens your eyes, you can't unsee what you've seen. Number five, We get to, say get to, get to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In Acts 22, 16, I I talked about the conversion of the apostle Paul. One of the, when he, the last time that he recounts it, he tells this part when Ananias came to him and he was blind and, and, and he was, and, and he, Ananias prayed for him and something like scales fell off of his eyes and, and, and he believed in Jesus. He believed in his heart that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. Ananias says to him, and now, what are you waiting for, Paul? Get up and be baptized, washing away your sin, calling upon the name of the Lord. How do we call upon the name of the Lord? We die to ourselves in baptism so that we can be raised up to live the new life. Number six says we get to, we get to die to our old selves in baptism so that We can live our new lives in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Romans 6, 3, and 4 says it this way, Or or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live the new life. That new life empowered by grace empowered by God so that we can go and do what God has called us to do. And then finally, number seven, we get to commit to live on a foundation of worship toward God and bring Him glory in every area of our lives. Romans eleven thirty six says, For from Him, through Him, and for Him are all things To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's the life we get to live. Amen.
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you and we praise you for your grace, for what we could never earn or deserve, for what, Lord, truly, honestly, we just can't even comprehend. But your love, your grace, your call to us to be your holy people, Lord, it changes everything. We ask, Lord, that right now you would drive it home to us, that you would help us to understand the magnitude and the weight of what it means to be lavished in your grace. Pray, Lord, that you would open blind eyes, that you would save souls, that you would cause us to believe in our hearts. Because it's only from you that that can happen. And it's only by your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.